Never eight. Hello, Squiddies! It is Tattoo Squid Podcast with your host, Dre, here with Antonio from the Cult Worthy Podcast. How hey, what's you? up? Antonio. I am great, man. Thanks for letting me be on your show. Yeah, no problem. I mean, it's been a while since I had, like, a guest on, you know, because I had, like, back drafts and back logs and and whatnot. So I'm trying to get people to do the movie movie game show um so i'm trying to get the brackets filled before march and i got a couple but i need like another 12 probably or 13 or something i don't know good luck (laughs) yeah maybe you can be a part of it yeah maybe yes i do like movies enough to have started a couple movie podcasts so (laughs) yeah there you go yeah, you know, so it's like, and, and and folks, if you're wondering what we're talking about here, you know, there's a thing called the movie movie game, which is on. Um, I mean, you mentioned something that you were talking with somebody prior about Kickstarter, so that's what this guy did with this uh, game. He was on a Kickstarter, got it going, and and now he's selling it all over the place. Um, which I have two, actually two games <laughs> which i didn't plan on it but that's what happens <laughs> yeah it's like i got one and all of a sudden oh wow here's the second one i'm like nice it's i nice. do that all the time man like i'll buy something on amazon and then like a week later i forgot that i i did and so i'll buy another one and then the one that i bought first shows up i'm like oh shit well i guess i got two now <laughs> yeah yeah speaking of amazon i got like uh uh safety vest coming in and another hat not like this, but something different, I guess. And uh, pieces of shit, yeah. <laughs> Which is like the, you know, the fun, you know, prop kind of thing you do. You know, you just put a piece of shit on somebody's fucking chair, and you're like, what the hell is this shit? Oh. <laughs> you know? So just to the misconceptions, and everybody's trying wondering why they're talking about that, and it's like. I was at work. Um, I work over now, so I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, I was working last night, and towards the early mornings of today, uh, supervisor, you know, which he's always like doing some jokes on everybody, or you know, if you're asking for something, he's like, "So okay, I can do it as." But you should go and get married. And I'm like, why? I was married before. I don't need to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's like me and my girlfriend are living together. So it's like we're married anyway. Right. Um, Yeah, we share the expenses. But then my supervisor turns around and goes, yeah, you know, why do I have to be the only one to suffer? (laughs) (laughs) So yeah it, it's crazy so we start joking around with each other and um he keeps on throwing that out there and then he starts teasing uh putting uh clip notes you know this uh the things that you do when, you, when you're on like uh on a job thing and you put it you post uh post-its that's what they call post-its <laughs> so he gets like these post-its and he puts like some crazy shit on there and he puts it on my my foreman's uh you know car like all over the place and he thinks it's funny and so now we open this drawer you know that he left open by accident and then my friend was like oh it'd be great if we could just shit in the drawer you know and i'm like you know what i'll get that (laughs) fake shit and then see what happens there you go i'll I'll be getting that probably tomorrow (laughs) <laughs> um, and then on Sunday when I go back into work, I'm like, hey, I got the stuff, you know. Well, anyway, so. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be funny if someone actually takes a real shit in his drawer and then everyone says that you did it, even though you were only intending to put fake shit in it? Yeah, but you know what? Because I don't even think that my, my foreman, I mean, I'm, uh, my supervisor would think I would actually do that. So he'll probably oh, okay. walk around <laughs> and see who, and he probably had would have an idea of who did it, you know. <laughs> And he you guys was, have like a shit lineup. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a shitty day. 
you know, it's what he's, he's like, he'd be taking a lot of shits on that one, you know, it's like, you know, it's a pooper scooper, and, <laughs> but we are here to talk, well, we're talking about shit, you know, we talk about a lot of shit, and, but um bump and, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so we're talking about like any kind of movies like today, like I was mentioning that I was watching a thing called uh, Have You Ever? And most of the people out there probably know the, the game, you know, Have You Ever, you know, Kiss a Girl in the Closet or no, Would You Would, would you, you Rather? Yeah, you know, Would You Rather, you know, Would You Rather Kiss a Girl in the Closet or Would You Rather, you know, Kiss Her in the Car or something like that. Well, this movie takes it to a whole different level. And it starts out, which I don't remember. I know that there's a, a girl. Her brother has some kind of illness that has needs surgery, but she doesn't have the money for it. And she finds out that this guy has a game going on and you win money. So he, she goes and it's like, well, you know, what do I got to lose? You know, so go to this mansion place out in nowhere. It looked like a, it looked like House on Haunted Hill, you know, kind of type of, you know, setting. And it actually did have, uh, now have you ever seen House on Haunted Hill, like the revised? Yeah, the one from like 99. Yeah, something like that, you know, where they had a, a Omar, um, uh, there was a, a black actor, uh, Tay Diggs. Yeah, I, I got them mixed up. I, I'm thinking of Omar, <laughs> uh, from the, Omar the program. Epps. Yeah, from the program movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we could, so you know, like that, but then the guy that was dead and he's like a surgeon that was in the in that that place with the, uh -huh. the, the fake that that little mustache thing. Yeah, he's in this movie, so I forgot what his name was. But he runs the whole thing, and he's like, you know, he has these henchmen, like, they're in the mafia. And all six people, you know, I think they were, like, related or something. I don't know. It just, it seems like a, a relation kind of thing. And it starts off, like, he goes, hey, anybody that wants to leave, the car's outside, you know, go ahead, don't worry about it. And one guy's, like, looking at this money, and he goes, no, nah, I'm going to stay. But then all of a sudden, after... The first round of games is uh we call it they put like shock therapy uh things around people's heads and then it's like all right would you shock yourself or would you go and shock the person next to you you know right the headband thing and they would do this you know like one around going around the table and then the guy gets shocked and he fucking instantly fucking dies you know and it's just like crazy. And then they got an L around. It's like, well, let's see. You can eat. Would you rather stab this person in the leg with a ice pick? Or, you know, do three swings with a, a, a Tibetan, um, like, yardstick. You know, like, <laughs> really, like, across the back kind of thing. And it gets really more crazier than that. You know, it's like, oh, you know, it's like. And they, they weed out everybody. You know, so everybody that dies, they drag them out. You know, right? The old woman in a wheelchair, she died just from fright, and then they wheeled her out. You know, and if you don't want to play it, they just shoot you right on sight. So it's almost like a saw movie kind of thing where they're not, you know, forcing you, but technically they are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's a it's a survival of the fittest and of the smartest kind of thing. I think that's interesting because, you know, Saw, when it came out in like 2000, what, two or three, the first one. Yeah. It really did kind of kick off that whole genre of death mechanism and kind of game of chance type of things. You yeah. know, we, we saw that explored more in Final Destination of like the grisly death because you cheated death, you know, stuff like that. And. Oh, yeah. It's an interesting genre. I think it kind of wore itself out, but people kind of go back and they rediscover them. And there is something rather ingenious about the creativity of mechanized death, right? Whether it's what Jigsaw does with his little puzzles and games, yeah. or like in this film where it is, you know, a, a, a saw-like situation, but with a multitude of people, not just Jigsaw and you. 
Yeah. But it comes to a question that I was putting on certain people and it was uh it was saying we called um that if do you think Jigsaw is a killer or does he kind of uh he doesn't really kill anybody so per se. He did once not as Jigsaw but like as his own self. Like right. Pull the bell kind of like white. And um and then uh what was the other thing? Oh yeah, then um you know but did he really kill him or did he give him the choice? You know I mean yeah, I mean that's rationalizing a, a situation that is going to result in a death if that person is either not smart enough, fast enough, or ruthless enough yeah. you know to to make the decision of whether or not they're going to die what would you do in that situation then would you play the game or would you see if the dude was bluffing well i mean honestly if you're stuck in like a bowels of hell kind of scene you know and then you wake up all you and you got this chain on you and there's like a chainsaw or there's like a shock therapy or and there's other people around you. You don't know who the fuck they are. And and it's just like, okay. And then you got this voice going. It's like, you, you let's play a game. Yeah, I want to play a game. I want to play the game. And then all of a sudden, you're like, he tells you the whole game is like, you need to go and cut your own arm off because you have this key that's going to go to your survival. And I'm like, okay, what happens? But then you see shit going on around you. Then you're like, oh, shit. You know, I'm going to shit my pants, but then, I'll, <laughs> you know, and honestly, I, I love horror movies. But if I get into that, 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 that situation, I will shit my pants. And, <laughs> and folks, not to get back to what we we're just talking about with shitting, you know, the, not, <laughs> not the, not the, the, the prop shit. I'm talking about the right. real deal, you know, holy shit and feel. You know, you'll shit your pants, and if by some chance you survive, you'll put those pants in your boss's desk. Yeah, you know, you put it there. <laughs> and you're like, listen, I just had a tremendous weekend, and <laughs> you know, you would not believe it if I fucking told you. And <laughs> but uh, yeah, we caught it. So so I mean, I love so I I watch like every I haven't seen Spiral because yeah, I haven't seen Spiral yet either. I just I you know. I love Chris Rock, but when somebody, you know, I I don't like it when they go and say, oh, I watched it, but it wasn't that good. And I'm like, yeah, but I got to see it for myself to know, you know, how it is. You know, I don't, yeah, I, I don't, I don't go by Cisco and Ebert and, you know, like, oh, we give it four, you know, four stars or, you know, two thumbs up or two down. Because you, it wasn't your kind of thing, yeah. You know, so right. Um, I mean, that's like the point of that's the point of my show is that films and art and stories are subjective. You know, one's man, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Yeah. And there are a lot of films, just like there's a lot of books or comic books, yeah. that a lot of people turned their nose up at when they first came out maybe because they were too progressive or they were speaking to a generation that wasn't there yet. I, I like to think of a lot of the films of the seventies, the counterculture films, you know, films like easy rider and stuff that found an audience with counterculture of the day, but that counterculture of the day was not who studios were marketing films to. Yeah. That was a film that grew out of a necessity of a counterculture wanting to be represented and that was the film that did it i kind of feel that we started seeing a lot of the horror films and the torture porn films of the late 90s and early 2000s 2010s that spoke to a more nihilistic negative alternative culture so like you know late gen x early millennials the goth culture these cultures that we're tired of watching fucking rom-coms, yeah, tired yeah. of watching Tom Hanks movies. There were filmmakers smart enough to think, you know what? 
the kids in the early 80s really loved slashers. And then the slashers became silly and no one cared anymore. Scream kind of reinvigorated that. So they wanted to take it to the next level. I think that for films like Saw and Final Destination and Would You Rather, and yeah. even in, into the A24 films of today, where they're kind of nihilistic and negative and there aren't really any winners. Everyone kind of loses and death and despair win. There was an audience for that. And I think now we kind of look at it as silly because the audiences are ready for something else, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like, because I love slasher movies. <laughs> I'll sit there like all that, like Halloween. I'm like, I'm sitting there going, yes, all right, who's going to go die next? <laughs> But it, it's just a wonderful, um, you know, it's like weird to, because I, I, and I don't really watch, in the beginning, I didn't really watch, like, say, Sleepaway Camp and all that, but then I started watching it, I'm like, oh, cool, now I know, like, the cult followings, and, you know, there's, like, a movie called A Pitchfork, and, uh -huh. um, or was it Pitchfork? I think it was, well, there was a guy that was, like, had, like, the military uh get up and then he would go around with a pitchfork and just like kill like everybody and it's like like a late no it's like an early 80s like late 80s kind of thing and it was just like uh no the prowler that's what it's called the movie oh the prowler is great yeah the plower from i want to say it's like 82 or 83 yeah. That was uh Tom Savini's first project after he was done the first uh Nightmare on Elm Street films. Yeah. Ooh, excuse me. Yeah, that's kind of like a classic of the slasher genre. I know. I was watching it a couple of days ago, and I was like, oh, I haven't seen this since I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. You know, so then it's just like, and I'm like, oh, okay, he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that whole thing, you know what's going to happen. and and But what is your favorite? Actually, I posted a thing on Twitter of if only we can be able to do this kind of movie where each superhero from Marvel or or DC, but DC seems like it's, I don't know if you're a, a comic book fanatic. Uh, and not so much. I mean, I, I know my way around a superhero for the most okay. part, but yeah. yeah, I'm more of a I'm more of a cult film, spaghetti, Western, Italian crime drama. Oh, yeah. Guy. But, I mean, like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, with the, the like say, Marvel, right? So you have, like, a character or characters of Marvel, and then they go against, like, a horror icon. You know? Like, I, and I was saying, like, oh, you know, like, Doctor Strange versus, like, Freddy Krueger. Right. You know? So you figure, you know, Doctor Strange sleeping whatever but he's the mystical guy that can go in any place anywhere you know with the magic and illusion and and here's freddy krueger in your mind about to kill you in your sleep kind of thing how that mm, how I like that it. rectify you know i mean here's the thing and this might get a little bit off topic but that might not be too unrealistic in the next 20, 30 years if Disney keeps buying up studios and possessing all their intellectual properties. Yeah. You know, I, I like to think that the film and the book Ready Player One was maybe not too far off from what the future might be, where you can live in a world where all of the intellectual properties and superheroes and film characters and video game characters exist in a, in a same universe. You know, if Disney keeps up buying all these different studios and all these different intellectual properties, why can't you have Freddy Krueger versus Dr. Strange? Why can't you have Ash and the evil dead versus Chucky? You know, it, it, it yeah. could really happen. Oh yeah, and then uh, we actually I think somebody like messaged me back and said uh, Captain America versus uh, Jason Voorhees. And I'm <laughs> like, hmm, yeah, that, that one I can see. You know, it's like, you know, because Jason comes back, or apparently he does that fast, kind of like he's here. Regeneration, <laughs> right? Yeah, he's here, but then all of a sudden, boom, he's right in your face. 
you know, or taking your face off, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and all that. But uh, are you like into like uh, music wise and, um, you know, because we always go with like in the different topics here and there. So it's not like just, you, you know. It's interesting. I just my my last episode that just came out this week was an episode on '80s horror needle drop moments. So, music moments in '80s horror that were recognizable. So, I love all types of music. I, I'm I'm not super familiar with with metal or country, but I, I do like punk rock. I do like a lot of you know '80s goth and punk and things like that. Ska. I love Jamaican ska and reggae. Yeah. But really, for me, I I associate songs and music in a cinematic fashion. I like to see how they're used in films, needle drop moments, or thematically. You know, uh, we were talking about how in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, they opened up the film with Oingo Boingo's No One Lives Forever. Yeah. And at the time, that that was not a hit single from Oingo Boingo. They were all about weird science at the time. Yeah. But the fact that they have one of their more like avant-garde songs in an avant-garde horror sequel that's just over the top with gore and tongue-in-cheek humor, like that is what kind of really gets me excited when I see a creative process of a band that's known to be flamboyant and crazy in a very crazy flamboyant film it's like two geniuses coming together and making something just extraordinary. And for a lot of years, people thought this Chainsaw 2 was a terrible movie. They compared it too closely to the original, when in reality, Toby Hooper was trying to get as far away from that as possible and go as far as he could, pushing the needle of horror and satire and gore. Yeah. Now, when I think of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I think of... Not the well, okay. I, I I saw the latest one they had on Netflix, uh huh. And I don't know, no, I didn't, I didn't like <laughs> either. Yeah, well, I'm it, like, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, you could tell the scenery is the scenery that's on you know the set, yeah, uh, the set scenery. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that that film and many other of these like horror remakes and reboots, they don't understand the assignment, you know, like Texas Chainsaw, the original Toby Hooper one. Yeah. It, it broke new ground in what you could show on film and what you could do with a horror piece. You know, we weren't dealing with zombies. We really weren't into like the slashers of the eighties yet. In a way, it's more psychological horror than it is, you know, real gory horror because there isn't a lot of gore in the original. It's all wow. kind of implied if, with the use of the chainsaw sound and how creepy Leatherface is and the maniacal family, especially the dinner scene. It, oh, it's, yeah. it's meant to create a sense of dread, right? Like you're sitting at that dinner table with her and the fear and the dread comes from how crazy the situation is it's not about who's getting hacked to pieces or sawed in half it, it's creating an atmosphere and a vibe and you know that is something that i could i'll give a little bit of credit to with maybe the first three saw films is that before they turn into like full torture porn gore they did a pretty good job at creating a, a mood an environment of dread, especially that first time that you see someone with the bear trap on their head and that you're playing a game and there's more tension in the moments leading up to her figuring out how to open the mechanism than the actual violence that we see later. Yeah. That's the assignment. A lot of these reboots and remakes, in my opinion, they're going straight for the jump scare and they're going straight for the gory kill, which to me mean nothing unless you set up the mood and the environment first. And that's where these kind of fail because they, they think that because of, I don't know, maybe audience test scores that people want to see more scares, more jump scares, more quick kills. 
it's unsatisfying at the end because you see a sequence of those throughout the movie, but just emptiness in between. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah we got, um, what was the other thing? Uh, what, what, what's your take on, like, say, Hostel? You know, because Hostel takes it a whole different level. Well, see, Hostel, I think the the way that Hostel plays, it is an homage to some of the exploitation films of the 60s and 70s. You know, so Eli Roth, who's, you know, a admitted cinephile, he loved retro and grindhouse films just like Tarantino does. Yeah. When you go back and you watch films like 2000 Maniacs or Wizard of Gore or any of the Herschel Gordon Lewis movies. They play a little silly. They play a little tongue in cheek, but they definitely were groundbreaking in the sense of how they could show dismemberments and really gory moments, even though the, the technology wasn't there for convincing special effects back in the 60s and 70s when they came out, they scared the hell out of people. Yeah. What Eli Roth did with Hostel and he did it too in uh, Green Inferno, you know, trying to play off the cannibal movies of the 70s from the Italian directors, is taking all those things that scared him when he was young watching these movies, putting them in almost the exact same environment as those movies, but now he's doing it with modern-day sensibilities of dread and camera work and a score that's actually menacing and not kind of silly. You see the DNA of those older films but you see him actually putting his flair and modern day flair on it. So I appreciate a film like that more than I appreciate a film like Would You Rather, which is really just kind of borrowing from films that were only made a few years before, not decades before. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they're like, oh, we're going to do this. And oh, hello. Somebody dropped. <laughs> <laughs> when my, my little uh, happy. Uh... Oh, I forget who it was. Oh, it's one of the anime characters. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, Hostel was like, they had, they, there was actually three. People don't even know that there was three movies of Hostel. And but I think Eli Roth only directed the first two. Yeah, something like that. Because the, the first one was based where all, there was all guys that got brought into the Hostel, which Hostel is, for some people that don't know, uh, the premise of the movie is there's an organization that lets other people that have money, which is millionaires, billionaires, whoever, uh, do whatever they want to do because they have the money for it. And if they want to kill somebody, they go and do it. Nothing's going to be done to them. You know, it's and it's in the setting of, say, like Bucharest or... Uh, I'm not gonna say Germany or anything like that, but I'm like certain areas. Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, certain areas in Europe or something. Yeah, you know, like Romania or something that's known for its like underground kind of you know thing. Yeah. And then, so that was like the first one. They had all guys, and you know they were setting them up by with these uh hot um the brothel kind of like women. You know. Yeah, they're like honey potting them. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second one is pretty much the women version. They just get all the women ones, and, you know, and start dissecting, if you will. We call it, you know, in that movie. But then the third one they have where it's a wedding engagement kind of, not engagement, uh, a wedding where you, you know, the bachelor party kind of thing. But right. the guy that's running the bachelor party is part of said institution that is using the bridal party as subjects in Las Vegas no less yeah so and there's your there's your sin city <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um yeah hostile and then there was a uh when you were talking about gory movies <laughs> one movie comes to mind when it's gory and and it's called uh uh, terrifier. That is the one with the clown. Yeah, we call. Yeah, he doesn't say anything, but he is. 
like maniacal with the killing and, and yeah yeah you know. i saw the first one i haven't seen the second one yet but i haven't um, seen the second one yet because i'm waiting for it to be more adjustable accessible like, yeah accessible that i can yeah. be able to go in and get it without have to worry about paying for something you know right. um which i don't mind but i'm paying for like a lot of shit to look at as it is anyway i think most <laughs> america is as it is um but yeah, that's like my favorite one. I was like, I was like, oh wow. But then with the second one, um, and I seen the characters on on who's in it, and there's a kid that wears like glasses and all that, and uh, and it's actually funny because the kid that's in the movie, he uh, at a young age, and I followed this kid, you know, on YouTube. He has a YouTube series. Um, I don't remember the kid's name but um actually i might have to look it up after but um he goes and does interviews with like metal acts you know like you know whoever it may be it could be like you know not led zeppelin but i mean like uh you know like ozzy osbourne he'll go in the thing yeah. or, or zach wild or or guys from a band called amana marf and all that like a viking band or you know just crazy you know interview stuff but then now he's interviewing there was a girl that he's interviewing that is was in terrifier or not not in terror he's, she's going to be in the second one but then now he's starring in the second one now so his dream came true and they put him in the movie where he's not really headlining the movie but he is one of a few that is the key parts, I guess. Right. Yeah. You know, so, but it looks like a really, but then some people give their, you know, outlook saying, all there is is blood and gore. That's all it does. And I'm like, yeah, that's what it <laughs> yeah, is. There's a, but there's an audience for that. Yeah. And, and I, and that's where, you know, where me, my show, I make it a point not to talk shit on any films. Yeah. I feel there's enough movie podcasts out there that are all about making fun of the movie or tearing it apart and taking shits on movies. And you know what? That's fine. For for every podcast like that, there's a podcast like mine where I want to make people aware of films they might have missed. And I will not speak about a movie that I myself did not enjoy. I yeah. might talk about it in passing, but I don't make it a point to be like, don't ever see Terrifier because it's just a gory mess of a... No, I don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd rather just... I would rather not just talk about Terrifier. Yeah. But one thing I can say about Terrifier is, you know, everyone talks about the... Now, I guess you could say, legendary hacksaw scene. Oh, you yeah. Know? Now, I, I, I was... I was... <laughs> impressed by the effect and i thought it was cool and very uneasy and disturbing yeah but just the year before the first terrifier came out another film came out bone called tomahawk. bone tomahawk yeah yep you knew where you knew where i was going with that i knew where you were going and with you know i had seen that particular effect done before in like the cannibal movies of the 70s or let me feel the 70s that uh Umberto Lenzi and people like that were doing, but never to such a dramatic effect as Bone Tomahawk did it because you were you were seeing the life go away from this body. Yeah. And just the way it was shot and the effect, it was a scene that really stuck with me. And I'm a person that can usually just blink right through any scene of violence or gore, and that one actually triggered me. Yeah. And I love I love the movie. I love that moment even more because I was like, hey, good job I hooped together because you incited a reaction out of me that I thought I was long since desensitized to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, was, <laughs> I saw that and I was like, and that, like you said, that was the first thing I seen. And I was like, you know, and then Kurt Russell's there and he's like the, uh, you know, guy, and he's like guiding his, uh, you know, soldier and making sure that he, you know, it's like, oh, no, you're, you're good. You're all right. You know, it's like, did he cut my head? And like, no, 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 you're good. And then they flip him upside down and uh, I'm like, 
Whoa. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's an intense scene. <laughs> and, and it's almost like I I'm gonna say Green Inferno, but I haven't seen the whole movie to see the certain things that they were talking about. You know, and and I'm not squeamish, and I'm. You know, and I was telling my girlfriend this week, uh, the only thing that will make me get, like, emotional is Homeward Bound. That... Yeah, I was just about to say that. Like, I can watch Terrifier 2 and Bone Tomahawk all day, but if you kill a dog on screen, man, or put a dog in danger, that makes me emotional as hell. Well, no, not even, like, like the dog, like... If somebody does that to a dog, I know, honestly, and I get pissed. I'm like, well, even the yeah. commercials you see on TV, you know, which I know I'm not promoting, you know, anything like this about like you know the commercial. But honestly, if I see a dog and I got a dog right now, because you know me and my girlfriend wanted to get a dog, and we did, she's a pain in the ass. Yes, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, it's our dog. You know, so right, right, like, right. all right, you know, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. But you got these people that get a dog, and they're like, all right, we're just gonna go, like, like say the like a weather, you know. I forgot, I forgot where you're at, but um, you know, I'm in Long Island, New York, and it's like windy as hell, it's cold, it's you know, like seven degrees almost, you know, and then you're gonna put a dog out there and like chain them to the tree, and you know, no food and. And what you're not gonna have no repercussions on it. I'm like, if I see you, if I know who you are, you're gonna get repercussions on me from me. We call it as it is. So, but that's, but like Homeward Bound itself was like when the dog, uh, the voice of like Michael J. Fox and the voice of again Don Amici. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, and uh, and and the voice of the cat. You know, they. Uh, you know, they they come home after like what a week of being not at the house or whatever, and right. kids are just like playing and whatever with the, the family, and here they come out of the woods and all that. I'm like, and that's a heartfelt moment. I'm like, and that that's the only movie that gets me every time. I'm like, I'll look at it and then I start tearing up, and I'm like, but then I can go and sit there and watch somebody get disemboweled. And, yeah, it's a weird thing, man. It's a weird and dynamic. Sleep. And then I, can and I can, sleep. <laughs> yeah, I can't even explain it. I can't even explain it. I think there is a level of uh, disassociation that I think maybe most people have, where you can say, okay, this is just a movie. They really didn't kill a person on screen. This is an effect. This is fantasy. Yeah. And I, even like children these days are are more desensitized to that kind of stuff than in my generation. You know, I come from a generation where kids were afraid of the Michael Jackson thriller video. And now it just kind of seems silly to most kids these days. But there is something about an animal movie, especially one like that puts animals in peril because we have a connection with animals, but it's hard for us to disassociate because we know that it, the animals in the movie aren't acting. You know, they're trained. They may as well be living props. It kind of sounds cruel to say that, but that's really what they are. They right. are not giving you an emotional performance, not really taking direction. They are just following commands and whistles and trainings for it. Yeah. So I, I think that there is a disassociation in there where we, we watch the film and we're like, okay, well, we know this animal is not acting. This animal is is being trained to be called so when you create a relationship like that with these these animal characters in the films, you don't have that that disconnect of oh that's just an actor they're getting paid. This is like that's an animal and it's in danger. And if it's not trained properly and if there weren't proper precautions, that animal could die. <laughs> it could really die. Oh, and yeah. we don't worry about that with humans. <laughs> nah. Of course not. You know? <laughs> they're like eh. We're a dime a dozen. <laughs> yeah, there'll be more made, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like watching a, oh, 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 geez, the the Ethan Hawke uh, movie, um, uh, with the vampires. Daybreakers. Yeah, we call where they yeah. have like a dime a dozen, you know, blood, yeah. you know, that they can use blood bags. Yeah, so they got like a whole bunch, and you know, that that that's a question that I wanted to go and ask you, you know, 
if you had a choice and would you rather be a vampire or a werewolf interesting question i kind of had this discussion on one of my last episodes when we were talking about vampire films all the music drops it depends on what kind of vampire honestly because um there are so many different variations of vampires in film we were talking about the gruesome vampires in films like 30 days of night mm-hmm. or near dark you know they're not sexy vampires but then you've got like the sexy vampires like the hunger and fright night and interview with the vampire where they almost make vampirism elegant and and kind of sensual and don't get me wrong i dig that but I kind of would have to say werewolf, even though it's less attractive than a vampire. Because I feel that most representations of werewolves, if you don't count the stupid fucking underworld movies, is that there is a real empathy and sympathy of the human side of the werewolf, knowing that he will kill, or she, like in The Howling, that they will kill, they will turn into a beast that has no remorse and no judgment and no sympathy. They are simply killing machines. Like I was talking about disconnects. There is a disconnect there where I can associate with the person who struggles with the idea that they know when the moon is full, they are going to become a killer, but they're not controlling their actions while they're a killer. There's almost like um, an ignorance to what they're doing once they turn back into human form. So it might be a more torturous life being that person knowing that they are going to eventually kill. And this is where it's kind of macabre. I would choose werewolf. You have an option of killing yourself. You have an option of, of destroying yourself where vampires for the most part are immortal and you really don't see them or hear them take themselves out unless it's like certain circumstances or certain films. So I I kind of appreciate the humanity more of a werewolf because that's what I identify with, but I'm not going to lie. I am turned on and I admire the personality attitude and lifestyle of a vampire. Yeah. Cause like even Bram Stoker's Dracula makes it more sincere somewhat. Yeah. He's a, he's, he's an emotional character. He's not just a killing machine. Yeah, I mean, he's like, you know, he dresses well, you know, and I'm not saying I'm going to be like a goth kind of like look, you know, but right. you got like ones where it's um, uh, like the Queen of the Damned kind of feel. Right. You know? And then, um, but me, I, I'm i looking at the prospect of the aspect, I mean, of if you're a vampire, you live longer. You know, you do the precautions of, you know, getting, you know, necess- uh, necessities and all that, like blood, do like the blood bank, you know, you get the blood thing going on, you got everything situated, you got money, you can, you're going to be living for a long time, you can adjust to different money situations that you see in movies, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I live for... You know, since 1800 or whatever. Now it's like 2023 and I got like five mansions and yeah, yeah, and, and whatnot. And like they, all they do, cars. they do make an elegance to to the vampires. Yeah. You know, and uh, and there, there was one, there was one movie I was watching and I, I can't remember the name, but it had a uh, Megan Fox in it. Um, and it's all like different, like vampires, like these girls are like, going around collecting money or collecting certain things from different uh uh for the boss which is a head vampire and there's this kid that's a uber kind of thing and he's driving these girls around at night and not knowing what they are but then he gets a glimpse of what they do and he's like holy shit they're vampires yeah but Mm -hmm. then he becomes one somewhat you know and he because he fell in love with one of them and right. it's not Megan Fox, but, you know, because, you know, Megan Fox basically, you know, destroys families. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even her own. 
but uh, <laughs> not to say that, I don't know. I mean, honestly, if celebrities are celebrities. They do that all the time, but um, yeah. But anything else that we want to talk about? Do you have something in mind? Uh, no, man. Like this was a really fun conversation. Uh, I, I like I said, I love talking about movies. Yeah, and that's what my podcast is about. And very rarely do I stray away from that. I would say that as much of a horror enthusiast that I am, and we talked about a lot of horror movies today, we talked about creatures and killers and, and you know, the hostile and torture porn and stuff like that. Yeah. My, my whole message to, to people who listen to your show, just based off of, you know, what I do on my show, is that there's always an origin to the horror. Like there really is nothing new these days that's coming out. And, you know, if, if there is, that's, that's awesome. But I bet if you dig a little bit deeper, you're going to find that there are films and stories from decades past that are really direct links to what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. And so I always encourage people to do their homework, go back, listen to shows like mine or yours, read some books, jump on IMDb and backtrack. You know, so if you liked Hostel, well, backtrack to where films like Hostel came from, to some of like the the hostage and torture films of the 70s, to the Herschel Gordon Lewis gory films of the 60s. And you could go maybe even further back to the Grand Guignol, you know, the theater where they would they would fake torture and death live on stage because people were so enthralled by the fact that it could be real. Nothing's really new. It, it's all just being reinvented. And the real excitement of that is being able to go back, especially now in this day and age of streaming and YouTube and you know all these different resources that we have to find film where when you and I were kids, we had the library and the video store and who knew if they had those films on the shelf. Yeah. So I always tell people, take advantage of the technology of today and go back and do your homework and dig into horror or whatever genre you like because you will find origins of the things that you love and it's really exciting to see where those things came from. True, yeah. As you can tell that I'm a horror guy, you know, like, ta -da! you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, especially with Frankie over there in the corner. I'm like, you know, he's listening to tunes as it is. But, uh, which is funny because I have uh, a vast array of different shit. And and you don't, and you can't see it, like, on this side. I wish you could. But there's, like, everything from, like, Camp Crystal Lake. And it's, like, a mixture of everything. So I got, like, stuff, like, for instance, uh like E.T. framed, and, you know, I got, like, Halloween right next to it, then there's all these, like, Funko Pops and different shit, and, you know, evil leprechauns, and Voltron, and, <laughs> you know, like I said, any even anime, like, I like a section of anime, like, right here on the desk, and... It, yeah, it's, man. It's, it's just, cool like, pretty, especially Lego Batman is, like, right in front of me. <laughs> Well, but, thank you so uh, much for letting me be on your show and talk about this stuff. Yeah, we call it. It's just like, and also, you know, you too can be part of the of a, the the movie movie game when okay. I start doing this. But tell everybody where they can find you. Um, you know what uh, segments or whatever you got going. Up. Yeah. So if you want to hear about obscure films, cult cinema and Undiscovered Gems. My podcast is the Cult Worthy Podcast. You can find me on any podcast platform or on my website, thecultworthy.com. I've got another show called The Cult Worthy Classic where I talk about films made before 1970. So that's when we're digging into the old treasure chest of classic and vintage cinema. And I put out episodes every Wednesday and Thursday. Nice, yeah. We got we gotta do like a, a segment together so I can like you know get into your show and and I'm I'm not and and I'll, I'll be honest about it because I'm not one to like 
know the back history of certain things, like the the whoever made the movie, and the, I mean like certain ones I know, but like say in the seventies and sixties, because that's your thing that you can uh, backtrack, as you said, you know, and you yeah. backtrack into like the seventies and sixties, and and you know, to me when I see the seventies and sixties, I think of Rob Zombie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with well, the, the... It's, it's an example. He loved the films of the 60s and 70s, especially Herschel Gordon Lewis, like I was just talking about. Yeah. You know, if you go back and you watch House of a Thousand Corpses, or if you go back and you watch uh, The Devil's Rejects, yeah. they are both essentially yeah. inspired from the film 2000 Maniacs. It's a great jumping off point to see where filmmakers and artists like Rob Zombie really took their inspiration and how much they loved that stuff because it just bleeds right into what they're doing but for modern day audiences and even the monsters that they he did a remake of yeah. it's not that bad it's I will defend bad. it for what it is it's exactly what I would expect from him it's a love letter to a show that was campy and silly and I think too many people were expecting his horror. And... I I thought he was going to like disturb because I never seen him to do a comedy. You know, right. like like Halloween, you know, he did a Halloween where it's like the other uh, retrospect of his side of what he thinks it would be. You right. know, and so he does Halloween like that way. Did 31 and did uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, which that... And you're talking about like weird family, you know, kind of aspect to it. That's another one yeah, where, sure. you know, you get in there and then they're taking people's faces off and they put it on their own. They're cannibals, <laughs> you know, and it's like a, you know, baby is baby, but she's hot and sexy, but she kills like no other. Yeah. Right. And, and the clown, you know, and, you know, God, you know. He, they took him away kind of early, you know, from us, you know, but even though he was sick, you know, they, he passed away, but, you know, they can't really do another movie with him in no. it, you know, no. I mean, they do yeah. a CGI, they did that with uh, Paul Walker, but, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, see how that went. Right, right, but, right. And, but, uh, you know, so then, that's pretty much it, folks. I mean, we... Yeah, thank you. ...dabbled in there everything we could think of um there's a lot more stuff to do but i mean you can dabble you know um but like you said follow them go to all the different uh podcast platforms you can go to mine where it's like linktree l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e backslash uh tattoo squid podcast all one word so it's t-a-2-s-q-u-i-d podcast and then you'll find all the different links, pr uh, platforms, and whatever. Uh, merch shops, you know. Um, I've been trying to, well, back back in a while, you know, I've been trying to get people to buy, you know, like, uh, my self-entitled uh, picture stuff of, uh, <laughs> right. of um, shower curtains. Because <laughs> there is a shower curtain with my face on there. Yeah, it, it's a caricature of my my face, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, believe me, it's not me looking in on you, or it could be. I don't know, but uh, yeah, there's like all my my logos are on like uh, you know for uh, a uh, shower curtain kind of thing. So if somebody buys one of those, please tag me on on. <laughs> Tag me on Twitter so I can see that you got it, and and I'll be like, <sighs> you know, well I'll see it if you bought it, yeah. But yeah, you know, I really want to see it that you have it hung up, and you know, your wife didn't like kill you, right? Which my, <laughs> which my girlfriend would probably kill me if I got like my own thing and put it up there in the, the shower. <laughs> it's like, why'd you get this? Why? <laughs> yeah. You know? I'm like, it's my podcast, but we don't need it here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you put it in your room with all the other stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but, just get your own second apartment and just have all your stuff in there. <laughs> I wanted to, I, I wanted to, like, even though we just 
we bought this house like last uh, October. No, last August maybe. And um, no, yeah, about well, last August. And then uh, I won, and I just saw it. I'm like, you know what? We should just knock this wall down and extend this, and I can put like more shit. Yeah. But I love your room. I love your room. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Your, movies your guys, like, you know, movies I, and I, movie posters. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I could have figured yeah. they were for more movies, you know, because you got the one shelf or uh-huh. two shelves. And I figured, I, you know, with you being the cult movie fanatic. It oh, goes yeah, all around yeah, the room. <laughs> oh, it's in front. Oh, okay. It's like what I have here. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's movie magic, folks. Movie yeah. magic. Yeah. All four walls and then some have shelves of, of films. But you know what? I'm a physical media guy because sometimes you can't find these things on streaming. That's where they trick you. So. Yeah, and when you try to find it and they're like, oh, you got to pay this amount. How about how about $19.99? Uh, how about no? <laughs> yeah, especially we call it, um, uh, you know, like Meatballs, you know, the movie. Yeah. yeah. You find it, but then they're like, you have to go and get Tubi or something or. Yeah. Or certain other uh, platforms or whatever, but Antonio, my my friend, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for uh, being uh, the 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 guest on this one, and uh, there will be other different podcasts. I mean, going on until I can get the you know the movie show, yeah, the movie uh, show going on, and that's gonna take up a lot of my time. I guess I don't know. But see what happens. I want to try. I want to try to do it. You know, like each week, put one out there and like, all right, this is what this started out with, and and then where wins that one gets uh, into one section, and then somebody else wins. They go, you know, how the the brackets go, and yeah, I um, love it. So it's well, it was a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, no problem, man. Uh, get some sleep because uh, I know I'm gonna need it because uh, I've been up since. 11 o'clock last night yeah so and it's an hour away until there you go (laughs) so all right sir take it easy folks take take it easy and um i think that's my girlfriend waking up (laughs) i'm like what the fuck is that (laughs) scaring the fuck at me anyway so um yeah gonna be doing another one probably i don't know when anybody else that wants to come on let me know uh, we'll set something up. All right, folks, take it easy. See you on the flip side. And 